Trauma from Occlusion Once upon a time there lived twin brothers, Joe and John. They were quite opposite to each other in their lifestyle. Joe exercised often and too intensely for long periods without proper guidance, while John was restricted to a sedentary lifestyle. Over some time, both of them started facing health issues. As Joe was over-exercising, he started to have body pains, while John started experiencing weakness and had difficulty balancing his body. After the physician's consultation, they realized the importance of the right amount of exercise on the body. Similarly, the right amount of stimulation by the occlusal forces is necessary for the healthy functioning of the periodontium. Now let's learn how insufficient stimulation affects the periodontium. In the case of John, not using the muscles resulted in a condition called disuse atrophy. Similarly, insufficient occlusal forces also result in atrophic changes, such as thinning of the periodontal ligament, osteoporosis of the alveolar bone, and reduction in bone height. Now let's learn in detail about the effect of excessive forces on periodontium. The occlusion that causes the trauma is called the traumatic occlusion and the tissue injury is called trauma from occlusion. It is important to note that all the malocclusions do not necessarily cause the injury. The factors that affect the tissue changes include magnitude, direction, duration, and frequency of the occlusal forces. These factors can be compared to Joe's case, where the problem was more than just over-exercising. It was also due to continuous, intense, and improper workouts, which increased the injury. Let's get into the details of each of them. An increase in the magnitude of occlusal forces leads to widening of the peritontal ligament due to an increase in the number and width of PTL fibers. There may also be an increase in the alveolar bone density. Moving on, the next factor is direction. A change in the direction of forces affects the periodontium. Periodontium can better tolerate the forces that fall along the long axis of the tooth. But if the forces fall in a rotational or horizontal direction, they cause a change in the direction of stresses and strains within the periodontium they are more injurious in nature. The next two factors are the duration and frequency of the forces. Continuous forces are more harmful than intermittent forces. And intermittent forces, if given frequently, can also lead to traumatic changes. Pop quiz. Now let's learn the classification of trauma from occlusion. It can be classified in two ways. Based on the onset of changes, it can be divided into acute and chronic trauma from occlusion. Next, based on the primary causative factor, it can be classified as primary and secondary trauma from occlusion. Let's first discuss acute trauma. Tarek, a 30-year-old male patient, came to my OPD. He said that he had sudden pain in the lower molar tooth, which he got filled a day ago. On examination, I noticed that the tooth was heavily filled with overhanging margins, tender on percussion, and grade 1 mobile. I diagnosed the case as acute trauma from occlusion. The cause of the pain is the improper restoration. I corrected the restoration and the pain reduced. In this case, the pain was sudden and due to the impact of abnormal forces created by the overfilled tooth which led me to the diagnosis. It can also occur due to biting on hard objects like olive pits, etc. This type of trauma subsides once the abnormal forces are relieved or if the tooth escapes from these forces by moving into a different position. In this case, as I corrected the restoration, abnormal forces were relieved 
and the patient was pain free. But if left untreated, the injury could worsen, causing necrosis, peritontal abscess formation, cemental tears, or may remain as a symptom free chronic condition. Next, let's move on to chronic trauma. It may occur as a consequence of acute trauma. But more commonly, it is seen as gradual changes in the occlusion in patients with parafunctional habits like bruxism and clenching. These changes include tooth wear, drifting and extrusion of teeth. Now let's move on to the second classification of trauma from occlusion. To understand this concept, imagine a healthy young man trying to lift a 30 kg rice bag and a weak old man trying to lift a 2 kg rice bag. The young man, though healthy, is unable to lift the rice bag because the excess weight is beyond his lifting capacity. On the other hand, the old man, previously capable of lifting heavy weights, is now unable to take up a normal weight due to his age-related weakness. Just like the young healthy man, a healthy tooth also cannot take up abnormal forces falling onto it. This is called primary trauma from occlusion. Here, the abnormal force is the primary etiologic factor, which may be caused due to insertion of a high filling, drifting or extrusion of teeth into the edentulous areas and functionally unacceptable orthodontic tooth movement. The older man situation can be compared to that of secondary trauma from occlusion. The tooth is unable to take up the normal forces falling onto it as it is weakened due to bone loss. Pop quiz. Now let us understand how tissues respond to the excessive occlusal forces. The tissue response takes place in three stages, which include stage one being injury, stage two repair, and stage three called the adaptive remodeling of the periodontium. In stage one, as the excessive occlusal forces fall onto the tooth, tissue injury occurs, resulting in increased bone resorption, and decreased bone formation. The areas most susceptible to the injury are the furcations. Bone resorption is noted in the areas of pressure and bone formation in the areas of tension. In areas of slightly excessive tension, periodontal ligament fibers elongate, apposition of alveolar bone occurs, and the blood vessels enlarge. In areas of severe tension, Widening of periodontal ligament space resulting in tearing of fibers and bone resorption are noted. In areas of slightly excessive pressure, alveolar bone resorption, widening of periodontal ligament and decrease in size of the blood vessels are seen. In areas of greater pressure, compression of periodontal ligament fibers, increased alveolar bone resorption, packing of erythrocytes in blood vessels, and rupture of blood vessel walls and release of its contents are noted. In areas of severe pressure, tooth root gets forced against the bone, resulting in necrosis of periodontal ligament and bone. In the stage 2, our body tries to repair the injury by removing the damaged cells. It forms new connective tissue cells, fibers, bone and the cementum. We can say that there is decreased resorption and increased formation of bone. Our body attempts to compensate for the lost bone by forming new bone. This is called buttressing bone formation. It is important to note that the repair process occurs when the offending forces are removed or if the tooth moves to escape from them. The next stage or stage 3 occurs when the body's repair process is unable to compete with the destruction that took place. It results in funnel-shaped widening of PDL, angular bone defects, and loose teeth. It is important to note that pocket formation is absent 
in cases of trauma from occlusion. Resorption and formation of bone return to normal after this stage. We hope you now have a clear idea on trauma from occlusion and its impact on the tissues. In the next video, we will discuss more details along with its management. We hope you had fun learning with us.